G'day, my name's Lloyd Grolleman, I'm the Aussie Pastor, welcome to our program today. And we have something very, very special for you. I got a mate, his name's Junior, he's a Kiwi, but his accent's American. And he has the most amazing story I think I've ever heard. It's a story that'll just blow you away. And so I got him to come into the studio and share that story with us. Hope you enjoy it, I'll tell you what, I sure did. In 1993, at the age of 17, I found myself sitting in a prison cell and all sorts of thoughts crossing my mind at that moment in my life, uh, mainly wondering how it was that I arrived at this point in my life. How was it that my life got so messed up that I am now sitting in a prison cell for the next 14 years of my life. In order to understand that, I got to take you back uh, and uh, explain how it was that I arrived uh, to that point, sitting in prison for the next 14 years of my life. Well, I was born in New Zealand, Lower Hutt, uh, Wellington. My mother and father were both Christians. However, my mother decided to leave my father when I was just an infant. And she decided to make her way to America and raise me uh, in San Francisco, California. Another unfortunate circumstance that occurred to me in my life was that I was molested as a child. And that also caused me to uh, come away from any, um, anything about God, wanting to learn about God. Um, I was just not interested, especially um, when, you come to, when you come to that point in your life where you just know what happened was not the right thing. And it caused a lot of shame and guilt within me. Um, and that's how I grew up. Um, I also witnessed in um, San Francisco. Now, when my mother moved to San Francisco, we stayed all throughout um, the ghettos of San Francisco, California. The influence that I was raised around, well, that was around me, were the influence of drug dealers, um, hustlers, pimps, prostitutes, gangbangers. Now, when I say gangbangers, they're uh, pretty much um, a group of people um, who are organized to commit crimes. Um, and so that's what I was involved in growing up in San Francisco, California, uh, committing robberies, thievery, home invasions. Um, I just didn't, just didn't care. When I was 12 years old, uh, having realized the shame and guilt of being molested um, and having nothing, wanting nothing to do with God, I literally got on my knees and prayed to the devil and ask the devil, whatever it is that you have to offer me, I want it. Give it to me. Give me the world. I found myself in juvenile detention centers. I had this little African-American friend uh, in my neighborhood. And I went to his house one day, and I just couldn't believe that practically everybody in his home was doing drugs as well as manufacturing drugs. And so that's where I learned how uh, to cook crack cocaine, heroin, and I began learning how to produce cooking um, and selling and uh, distributing uh, drugs at this point in my life. And I was very, I suppose you can say, content with um, that lifestyle because then I was putting money into my own pocket and putting money into your own pocket has um, 
a sense of power that nobody can tell you what to do. You're your own man. You got your own things. And so I thought I was at the, the height of life. Why did I need to sell drugs? I don't need to sell drugs. I'll just go to the main source and rob the drug dealer. And so uh, that's what happened. And that's what ended me, landed me into prison for 14 years of my life uh, at the age of 17. It was hard because um, you're always locked up in a cell when something goes wrong, a fight breaks out in the yard, um, or uh, it can be something as simple as uh, disrespecting a correctional officer. Um, you can be locked down from uh, six months to a year at times. And this level four was very stressful and became very angry, very bitter about life. And that bitterness caused me to vent my anger at times on other inmates. I had a sister that my mother was pregnant with when she left New Zealand. And when my sister turned uh, the age of 18, she applied to come visit me and her visitation was approved. And I was very happy to see her because I knew then that um, I could have my sister smuggle in dope for me uh, to look after me and as well as for me to, um, to get high. You see, while I was in prison, oh, if I could get my hands on drugs just to numb the pain of uh, being an outcast of society, um, I would do it. Uh, however, one day she, she came up to me and she, she walked through the visiting room and my sister had a different glow about her, a glow I was not accustomed to seeing. She had a really nice, beautiful smile on her face as she was making her way uh, towards the table that we were seated at. And as she sat down, I asked my sister, I says, uh, what's, what's so different about you? Something's different about you. I, I, can't, put, I can't put my finger on it. Uh, what's going on here? And my sister said to me, you know, brother, I love you, right? I says, yes, yes, I know you love me. And she says, um, I want to change my life. And at this point, I was like thinking, okay, um, what is this change that is about to occur? You know, you can change all you like, but just don't... Uh, get in my way of uh, conducting business in the prison system because without my sister, there would be no business. And so that's all I was just thinking about. How, uh, anyhow, she told me, brother, I want to give my life to Jesus. And those were words that I did not want to hear. Give your life to Jesus. What you mean, give your life to Jesus? What has Jesus ever done for you, for me, for us, for mama? Mama's still living in the ghetto. What you mean? You want to give your life to Jesus? Did Jesus ever put those nice clothes on your, your back and feet so that you won't be teased at school? Did Jesus buy you that nice vehicle that you're traveling in to come and visit me? What has Jesus ever done for us? And I thought uh, to myself that perhaps I discouraged my sister because she continued to smuggle my dope in. She continued to look out for her brother. Everything I knew I had taught my sister before I got locked up in prison. And so I just thought to myself, well, it's time for her to look out for me. Well, again, one Sunday, she comes to visit me and 
I asked my sister, I says, you have that for me? She says, yes, I have that for you. You know I love you, brother. I says, that's what I'm talking about. That's all I want to hear is that you love me. And so she dropped it off and I went back to my cell that same day with my drugs. And well, the next day, the counselor calls me into his office and tells me that my sister had died. She had died two o'clock in the morning. And it's interesting because you would expect someone to mourn the loss of a loved one, but I didn't. That's not what occurred to me. I mourned the fact that I would never be receiving any more dope from the streets. I mourned the fact of my selfishness. In 2007, they decided to release me a year early because they did give me a 15 year prison sentence, but I learned how uh, to behave myself and mind somebody. And so uh, they decided to release me a year early. However, uh, they released me to the immigration department. Um, and so when I went to court in front of the judge, um, in immigration, the judge told me that there was no hope for me to remain in the United States and that um, my family, my mother uh, could not help me. And so he said, um, son, uh, we've declared you a menace to society and um, we would ask that you never return to the United States. And if you uh, try and attempt to return into the United States, uh, we will charge you as uh, an international terrorist. Those were the words of the judge. So after the court hearing, um, they shackled me and handcuffed me and two federal marshals escorted me uh, onto the plane and back to New Zealand. As I opened the door to walk out, there was a man standing on the other side with his arms wide open, talking about, welcome home, son. And at that moment, things were just happening so fast, running through my mind. Um, here it is, a man is standing right before me with his arms wide out, talking about, welcome home, son. But in my mind, I'm thinking, who is you? Who is you talking about, son? You ain't never been in my life. How dare you call me son? Now, these are just thoughts that was occurring in my mind really quick, thought after thought. And then anger just came in. And I remember thinking, vengeance, vengeance is mine. This man is here standing before me, claiming to be my father. The thought came to my mind saying, hey, dummy, you ain't got nowhere to go. Where are you going to go? You don't know nobody in New Zealand. So as that thought settled into my conscience, I felt my arms beginning to open up. And the words came out of my mouth, Daddy, where you been all my life? I love you, man. But at the same time, I was thinking to myself, I'm going to destroy your life. Everything that my mama and my sister and I suffered, you are going to suffer. So I accepted the invitation to uh, go live under his roof uh, and doing that I didn't realize that my father had something on his side that would cause uh, another change in my life 
and he had a loving wife, my stepmother. This stepmother of mine just completely showed me love that I had longed for all my life. She loved me like I was her own son. She cooked food for me every day, made sure I had money in my pocket, was always in my business asking me if I was all right, where are you going, what are you doing today? She just gave me so much attention that I felt loved. I came to a point where I realized as I'm looking around uh, the factory and watching uh, these folks standing on the assembly line from nine to five, uh, some were high on drugs. And um, I sort of figured, well, if I'm gonna make it, forget breaking my back, I might as well use these folks as my clientele. Since they love to get high, why not use them? And that was the thought that was going on in my mind. And so I had been working towards um, establishing um, that drug market once again. Uh, and a week before I was to make a major transaction, uh, an injury occurred to me in the factory where you see these scars on my hands and arms. Uh, I was down there working on what they call an under, underlay peeling machine. Uh, the machine got stuffed up and I had to get on my, hand, my hands and knees and clean it out. And as, I, as I'm on my hands and knees uh, cleaning it out manually, I can see a shadow standing at the head of the machine. And I happened to look up and acknowledged my coworker who was also standing there. And he looked down at me and he acknowledged me. And I went back to cleaning out the machine and he turned around back to uh, the control panel and turned it on. However, before that incident occurred, I had accepted an invitation by my father, by my father to attend church on a Saturday. Now I went to church because um, there was just simply nothing to do that Saturday and uh, I was always open to socializing. As I'm sitting in the church, I'm understanding nothing that was being said in the service. Um, all that's going on in my mind is, how am I going to get this young lady? How am I going to get this young lady to notice me? And so um, a thought occurred into my mind. Uh, why don't you get baptized, man? That'll be impressive. And so I went to the pastor. Uh, I approached the pastor and I says, Pastor, I want to get baptized. And pa pastor looks at me and says, um, have you had Bible study, son? And I looked at pastor and I says, Pastor, you know Jesus is coming soon. And it seemed like that's all the pastor needed to hear. He says to me, okay, son, you'll get baptized. I was thinking to myself, oh, yep, that'll look good on my resume. Put that on my resume. That young lady will be, she'll like that. And so it came my turn. Everybody that went ahead of me, uh, they, they sort of, everyone went in there and uh, sort of put their heads down and uh, just, had that uh, sort of um, mannerism uh, that was um, that mannerism of submission. And so I get in there and walk into the font and stand in front of the pastor. And, and uh, I'm thinking in my mind, no, oh, I'm, I'm not going to look down. I'm going to look up. So I'm standing there looking up. And I remember thinking to myself, well, uh, if you are real, whatever it, this is, uh, uh, yeah, I commit my life over to you. Uh, is that what this is about? But if you are real, whatever.
And I remember thinking that. And so <clears throat> got baptized and got out the water and then the church made me a Sabbath school teacher. Uh, they made me a youth teacher. Now I'm teaching the Bible to the young people. Interestingly enough, <laughs> Junior knew nothing about the Bible. What was I going to teach these young folks? So a little over a year, I attended this class with no students, none. And um, <laughs> I remember thinking, man, what am I doing here? What is this? Every Saturday I'm showing up, you know, expecting to teach some young people and there are no, there's no one here. Well, another thought crossed my mind. My, uh, I was impressed with the thought that, hey, uh, didn't it ever occur to you that uh, you had been the student all along? I was, that hit me because it was true. I knew nothing about the Bible. What was I going to teach these kids if they came to class? I knew absolutely nothing. So now I've been baptized and they made me a school teacher. Uh, they also wanted to make me a deacon. And um, I also became the youth leader uh, of the church. And um, I was just thinking to myself, oh, yeah, put all that on my resume. She'll be impressed about that. Um, well, it would be a year later that um, we would actually tie the knot and that young lady uh, became my wife and I became her husband. Um, and at that stage in my life, um, going back to uh, the factory, the bed making factory, they were calling me back to work because I had been off of work for almost two years and I didn't want to return back to work. I was like, nah, that's not what I was, that's not what I want to do in life. And um, so I asked my wife, uh, What's, what do you think is my purpose in life? Uh, not just asking my wife, but uh, also people around me were telling me that uh, from the church that I should uh, go to seminary school and uh, become a, a pastor. So in 2013, my wife and I was married, ready to make our way over to Australia. And I remember landing into Australia and coming through customs and we got into the car and shot straight up to uh, Newcastle where the school was. And I had been accepted into this theology degree program. I was so excited that, man, I'm, I'm an academic student now, you know. Um, so the semester started that year in 2013 and um, I failed uh, the first semester miserably. Every unit in my uh, course, I failed miserably. And I was very distraught. Um, as a matter of fact, I went and had a talk with the lecturer as to uh, where do I go from here. Well, the lecturer told me uh, that there was a program that they offered uh, students to, um, to do, which was um, academic English, learning uh, writing, learning speech, um, learning um, how to do an essay, uh, things of that sort. And so uh, the lecturer uh, told me, uh, son, don't do one semester do two semesters uh, and he believed I really needed it as myself I, I really needed that um, so went into uh, that program they called it general studies um, and that would help me uh, write uh, better uh, uh, that would help me in my speech uh, that would help me uh, more so in um, analyzing uh, evaluating and uh, creating 
uh, as far as uh, writing is concerned. So um, instead of two semesters, I ended up doing three and spent three years up there uh, learning academic English. Um, now, there was one course where I failed um, the exam three times. It's just something about setting an exam I couldn't get over. Uh, the pressure of sitting there for two hours answering uh, three questions, the pressure just, I couldn't get over that. Uh, however, uh, the school told me that they could not keep taking money from me and me failing. And so I had to make the decision uh, to come away from school, to, to leave school altogether. Um, nonetheless, uh, I had a talk with my wife, and um, this is where uh, I believe my relationship with God, well, I believe that my relationship with God um, upon me entering into school, that this was real. Um, the change that he was going to work in my life was going to be real. Uh, and I saw that happening. Uh, and this is where my personal saving relationship with Jesus began to take off. Uh, I began trusting, praying. Uh, my spiritual life uh, was being devoted daily. Um, every day um, and so now uh, I find myself uh, it's 2017 and I find myself as a Bible worker uh, in the Blue Mountains of Katoomba uh, having Bible studies and uh, organizing uh, ministries for the young people um, and God is still using me um, in ministry, and I believe that God is not done with me yet. Uh, and so uh, I now work with the associate pastor of New Hope Church, and uh, it's a very uh, fulfilling um, ministry. It's a very fulfilling joy in my heart today uh, to continue to trust in God and what He has planned uh, for my life. Quite a story, isn't it? You'll notice in the middle of this program, Junior had a book that helped him find Jesus. And it is an incredible book. It's called The Desire of Ages. And today, I want to offer it to you free, absolutely no obligation. Just contact us. I'll tell you what, we'll get this book out to you as soon as possible. My name's Lloyd Grolleman. I'm the Aussie pastor. And I love you a whole heap. So does Junior. But you know what? God loves you a whole heap more. See you next time.